Thank you all for joining us for another in the series of Red Lion webinars. I hope you're all coping okay with lockdown too. One week down, three to go, fingers crossed. If you don't already have a drink in your hand, then I hope that all that stands between you and a glass is the three of us and 50 minutes of interesting chat about fairness and funding of private prosecutions. It's my pleasure to share the screen with two very talented professionals, Simon Davison and Maurice McSweeney. I have first-hand experience over many years of working directly with them both, and I can say that each is a class act. Simon Davison is Director of Investigations at Another Day, a risk, security and investigations company based in London. Simon leads the investigation team and a substantial part of their investigation work is on private prosecutions. Simon was a detective in the flying squad in the Met Police before moving into private practice. And as a detective, he regularly conducted high profile and complex investigations into organized criminal networks and ran covert firearms operations targeting armed suspects who were planning high profile and high risk offenses in London and the UK. And of course, that's where our paths first crossed in Operation More Gold, which was such a long time ago now, I hear that D1 is soon to be released from prison. Since leaving the Met and joining another day, Simon's acted as officer in the case in several large private prosecutions. He's on the steering committee of the Private Prosecutors Association and assisted in the writing of the code for private prosecutors. He's written and spoken extensively on the subject. Maurice McSweeney is a Director of Litigation Funding at Harbour, which is the world's largest privately owned fund, supporting those involved in litigation and arbitration. Maurice works with solicitors, general counsel, insolvency practitioners and barristers to identify cases which may benefit from funding. He then presents them to Harbour's Investment Committee and Board for approval. He also trains lawyers on how litigation funding can help their clients. Morris started his career working for a specialist firm of fraud litigation solicitors before joining Harbour, and he had spent 10 years developing business for two leading sets of chambers, and it was in the first of those, Two Hair Court, that we met. Morris is on Twitter at LitFunder, Simon is as well, but Morris is on Twitter at LitFunder, and he's happy to be linked in or email with any friends of RLC and we'll send out contact details to you all for both Simon and Morris in an email after the event. So the trigger for this evening's conversation about fairness and funding of private prosecutions was the Justice Select Committee's investigation following the post office scandal. It may be that many of you know the details, but I'm going to start us off this evening by condensing a story that spans 30 years into about 15 minutes. I'll then talk about the Justice Select Committee's investigation and recommendations, which will lead into a conversation with Simon about fairness and in investigations and with Morris about funding. So what was the post office scandal? Well, a recent article in the FT called it a tale of bankruptcy, jail and ruined lives, and they were not wrong. In the late 90s, the post office was contributing hundreds of millions of pounds a year to the Exchequer, but as the world changed with the advent of in internet, email, finances started to slide. A 1996 plan to modernise its operation, the government awarded a contract to computer services company ICL, which later formed part of Fujitsu, for an ambitious project to start paying welfare benefits in post offices with swipe cards. The aim was to cut fraud, which is ironic, and to automate a range of activities. While within three years it had turned out to be a monumental failure of IT procurement, abandoned only after wasting almost a billion of public and private money. And it was from the ruins of that post office project that officials salvaged what would become known as Horizon. Repurposed as an electronic point of, steps, point of sale system, it replaced paper with commuter, computers. And shortly after Horizon's rollout, branches began to see strange numbers appearing. Not unusual in a business that turns over large amounts of cash perhaps, but those discrepancies were many times higher than normal. And one of the postmasters that that happened to was a chap called Alan Bates. And for many years, he was a voice in the wilderness, but it was really his dogged determination uh, that uh, 
meant that he was eventually proved right. It's his name that appears first on the list of claimants in the litigation and judgment. He and his wife ran a branch in North Wales and within weeks of Horizon being installed in his branch in 2000, a 6,000 pound deficit appeared in his accounts. It was only by printing off meters of transaction data on four inch receipt paper and searching manually through the entries that he discovered duplicated bank payment transfers, which he believed were caused by an overnight software patch. He made a request to post office for greater access to the branch data, but that went unanswered. And after five years as a sub postmaster, having done nothing wrong, his contract was terminated without explanation. He refused to give up. He set up a website detailing his treatment to warn others and little by little similar tales started trickling in. And that led to the birth of Justice for Sub Postal Masters Alliance, which united victims and injected a little bit of political impetus. In some ways, he was fortunate as he was able to prove his innocence and wasn't prosecuted, although of course he was unfairly punished by losing his contract to run the post office. Many sub postmasters were unable to show that the accounting errors were computer generated and they were prosecuted. One of them was a lady called Jo Hamilton. She took over South Warmbra branch in Hampshire in 2003 and she rang the Horizon helpline after the system recorded a 2000 pound shortfall in her accounts in December of that year. But when she did what she was advised to do by the helpline, it simply made the shortfall double. And the post office said she had to pay back the money and started deducting 300 pounds a month from her wages. Deficits continued to appear. Out of desperation, she started to pay off the deficits out of her own savings and eventually the money ran out. The post office launched a private prosecution, but then offered to drop the theft charges if she pleaded guilty to 14 counts of false accounting. She felt she had little choice. At her sentence in February 2008, 74 people from the village, including her local vicar, turned out at Winchester Crown Court to support her. But even uh, that didn't help as she was handed a 12 month community order having pleaded guilty to false accounting. She now works as a cleaner, but even volunteering at her granddaughter's school is problematic because she has a criminal record. So many sub postmasters felt unable to effectively defend themselves against the resources of the post office. Many sub postmasters went to prison. Many became bankrupt, two have since died and sadly one committed suicide. Victims were reluctant to sue the post office, in part because if they took a case to the High Court and lost, as we all know, they'd be forced to pay the post office costs. Following the formation of Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance in 2009, uh, the BBC did some pioneering investigative work and there was a debate in Westminster Hall in 2014 and the cause of the sub, -post sub postmasters gained national attention. That led in March of 17 to the first group litigation order issued in relation to sub postmasters claims. It covered losses sustained by them as a result of Horizon, criminal prosecutions that they had been subjected to, bankruptcy proceedings and unfair contract terms. There were in excess of 500 claimants and litigation was backed by a firm of litigation funders that finance cases in return for a percentage of the compensation. Those claims were settled last year for 58 million. In a judgment handed down on the 16th of December last year, Mr Justice Fraser found against the post office on the evidence relating to Horizon. His judgment runs to 313 pages excluding the appendices and the real guts of the criticism of Horizon is in the appendices. But Mr Justice Fraser made detailed findings about long-standing defects in Horizon, finding that post office had shown a pattern of defensiveness and a lack of transparency. He invited the DPP to investigate the actions of Fujitsu in a scathing indictment of post office conduct. He said this, he said, the approach by the post office has amounted in reality to bare assertions and denials that ignore what has actually occurred 
at least so far as the witnesses called before me in the Horizon Issues trial are concerned. It amounts to the 21st century equivalent of maintaining that the earth is flat. As one of the aims of the talk today is to provide some guidance as to how to ensure fairness in private prosecutions, and that's what Simon's going to deal with, it's worth looking at a little detail of what Mr Justice Fraser meant by a lack of transparency. And so forgive me for reading three paragraphs of his judgment. What he said was part of the experts agreement that bears consideration is that the post office have to know about bugs, defects and errors in order that they can agree with Fujitsu that fixes have to be written and applied. This makes it particularly important that Fujitsu are open and transparent with the post office about the presence of software bugs, errors and defects. Given that Horizon was being used by the post office as the accounting procedure between it and its sub postmasters, there is every reason that Fujitsu would or should have to make the post office aware of bugs, errors and defects. Fujitsu would regularly record user error simply as a catch-all and effectively require someone to rule it out to their satisfaction. And unless this were done, Fujitsu would remain wedded to user error as an explanation. Given the technical investigations being done by Fujitsu itself, Fujitsu rarely, if ever, ruled out user error by the sub postmasters which was wholly in Fujitsu's interests. Mr Justice Fraser went on to say, however, if one's to take an objective and sensible view of the evidence of a previously trusted sub postmaster, who the post office itself used to train other sub postmasters for some years, who stated that he did something correctly and X occurred, then meeting that with a bare assertion that X simply cannot have happened is not particularly sensible, nor is it persuasive. The approach by the post office to the evidence of someone such as Mr Latif, he was the um, person referred to, demonstrates a simple institutional obstinacy or refusal to consider any possible alternatives to their view of horizon, which was maintained regardless of the weight of factual evidence to the contrary. That approach by the post office was continued, even though there's now considerable expert evidence to the contrary as well, and much of it agreed about the existence of numerous bugs. So that was December last year. Um, between March and June of this year, the Criminal Cases Review Commission identified 47 cases with a realistic prospect of being overturned. At the last count, the post office had chosen not to contest all but three of them. Following what's been described as the biggest miscarriage of justice in British history, the UK government appointed Mr Justice Wynne Williams to lead an inquiry into the scandal, including the actions of Fujitsu. The CCRC asked the Justice Select Committee if it would undertake a review of the circumstances and safeguards where an organization is allowed as the post office was in these cases to act as prosecutor when it is also the victim and the investigator of an alleged offense. So the Justice Select Committee, that's how they came to investigate. The committee is chaired by Sir Robert Neal MP and uh, there were a number of terms of reference but uh, if we go to their findings, they focused on the effectiveness and existing safeguards and merits of additional safeguards that could be used to limit the potential for the right to bring private prosecutions. It didn't investigate post office or horizon because that's the subject of an ongoing inquiry by BIS, a different select committee. And that select committee inquiry itself is on hold pending the independent review. The Justice Committee heard evidence on the 7th of July and a record of the speakers and transcript of the evidence is available if you're interested on the committee's website. It published its 37 page report last month on the 2nd of October and its main findings were that the startling figures of the scale of post office prosecutions together with concerns in relation to the RSPCA in 2016 
and reports that the number of private prosecutions is rising, that justifies a proactive approach to examining the effectiveness of regulation in this area of the criminal justice system. So regulation is uh, to be expected. Uh, in terms of the state of private prosecutions currently, they recorded that it's a strength of the current system that it enables corporate victims of crime to pursue justice when public authorities decline to intervene. They commented that the lack of a prosecution can represent injustice as much as a prosecution wrongly brought. But in a modern CJS, whether an offence is prosecuted or not shouldn't depend on whether the victim has the financial resources to conduct a prosecution. It recommended, in agreement with the Crown Prosecution Service, that the government should ur urgently review funding arrangements for private prosecutions in order to address the inequality of access to the right and ensure a fair balance between the prosecutor and the defendant and to ensure the most cost effective use of public funds. They acknowledged a proposal made by the Centre for Women's Justice that private prosecutors recoverable costs should be capped at legal aid rates. And uh, they commented that there should be no disparity between the claims that can be made from central funds by prosecutors and defendants. They supported the proposal made that defendants prosecuted by private prosecutors should pay no more than would be paid as if they had been prosecuted by the CPS. What did they say about the effectiveness of existing safeguards? They said the government should strengthen safeguards that regulate private prosecutions to ensure that any organization that conducts a substantial number of prosecutions is subject to the same regulatory standards and expectations of accountability and transparency as a public prosecutor. They made a recommendation that the government consider enacting a binding code of standards enforced by a regulator that applies to all private prosecutors and investigators. In respect of strengthening the safeguards, they recommended that HMCTS establish a central register of all private prosecutions in England and Wales, because one of the problems is that nobody really knows how many there are. And they also recommended that HMCTS ensure that the CPS is notified when a private prosecution is initiated and that notification process should be integrated into the structure of the central register. Uh, they agreed that every defendant who's privately prosecuted should be informed of his or her right to seek a review from the CPS. They recommended that that change be implemented by change to the criminal procedure rules. In situations where the police are involved in the private prosecution and the role of the magistrate is circumvented, which was something that was drawn to their attention by the Criminal Law Reform Now network. They said it would be especially important that the defendant's notified of his or her right to request a review of the prosecution. They recommended in such a scenario that there should be a duty on the police to inform the defendant that they're to be prosecuted by a body other than the CPS and that they have a right to request a review. Uh, finally, they said there's a strong case that organisations that bring significant numbers of private prosecutions should be subject to inspections. If an organisation is found to be misusing the power, then the body responsible, uh, whoever is enforcing it, should be able to remove the right of an organisation to bring a prosecution or require them to obtain consent from the AG or DPP before they can initiate a prosecution. And they ended uh, by uh, issuing this warning that it's incumbent on the government to ensure that the rise in the number of private prosecutions doesn't result in the development of a parallel system where the public interest, accountability and transparency are secondary to private interests. So that's setting the scene as it were, the post office scandal leading to uh, our public inquiry and the recommendations of the uh, committee just last month. So um, some points highlighted by Mr. Justice Fraser as to what went wrong in the post office case and the recommendations of the justice report leads in then to Simon to talk to us a, a little about how to ensure we don't follow in the footsteps of post office. Uh, well, thank you, Kate. Um, 
And what I'd like to do, I think, is to discuss the issues around the investigation phase of a private prosecution and how uh, an in inadequate or poorly run investi investigation can undermine a prosecution. And as you say, look at what steps should be taken to ensure that a private prosecution remains fair, effective and, and ultimately safe. Um, you touched on it briefly, but ultimately a private prosecution is a, is a useful tool for allowing victims of crime to seek justice where traditional state prosecution bodies such as the police, SFO, uh, are unable, unwilling or don't have the capacity to assist. Um, but inevitably, the process of a private prosecution is, is rightly subject to greater scrutiny than a state-led prosecution. Um, so the first thing I'd like to address is the, is the process of starting a private prosecution um, and ensuring the prosecution is brought correctly, both in order to give the prosecution the best chance of success, but also in order to ensure convictions are safe and to prevent miscarriages of justice, it means getting the process absolutely right from the very, the very beginning of the, the investigation and prosecution. Um, in many cases, the alleged offence uh, will have already been reported to law enforcement, but this is not always the case. And, and in our role, we'd always recommend that a crime is reported through the, the normal channels. But often, as we see in the case, certainly of, of corporate fraud, this isn't investigated or, or prosecuted further. Um, so in terms of safeguarding and, and, and managing a private prosecution, uh, the fairest and safest way to run it is to, to effectively replicate the police and crown prosecution model as far as is possible. Um, the ideals of a police investigation are openness, transparency and fairness, and that should be at the heart of any criminal investigation, be it a, a state run uh, prosecution or a private prosecution. Um, with any criminal prosecution, the duty of the investigator uh, is ultimately to the court and to ensure that all reasonable lines of inquiry are pursued, both that lead towards and away from the guilt of the, the, the accused party. Uh, and this is to ensure that an open mind is kept and therefore any evidence obtained in the course of the investigation is carefully considered and is not biased towards the suspect or the victim. Um, a key element really in safeguarding a private prosecution is ensuring uh, disclosure obligations are, are adhered to, uh, which is very difficult to civil, lit civil litigation and is one of the key duties of the prosecution and I'll, I'll come into that into more detail. Um, but ultimately a private prosecution requires careful management from the outset. Um, which can be difficult when pursuing lies of inquiry or reviewing material that may exonerate a suspect given the client who's often the victim is, is paying for this. So this should be addressed early at, during the client onboarding process so that the victim who's often the client understands the process and obligations that they have in similar, uh, criminal proceedings as opposed to civil. Um, and to ensure this process works, we, we routinely ensure our clients sign a declaration before starting the investigation and private prosecution which explains the processes, procedures, and ensures they're aware of potential issues that may arise from the outset. So for example, we'd explain to them that uh, they may not be able to see other witnesses' evidence, uh, case files and documents may not be shared with them. They need to understand the onerous and potentially intrusive disclosure obligations. Uh, they need to understand the requirement to investigate all reasonable lines of inquiry. And also that these cases are often complex, there are very high evidential burdens of proof and standards that need to be met. Um, so what, one, of the, one of the recommendations we've made and, and how we work is, um, and the best way of managing an effective and safe private prosecution is to have a separate investigation team uh, who are independent of the victim and, and the law firm, who are effectively taking on the, the police role of officer in the case and disclosure officer. And this is aligning those roles as far as possible in the same manner as a state-run investigation. So this allows the victim, who's often the prosecutor, uh, bringing the private prosecution to remain as a key witness, who's untarnished by other information, other information obtained during the investigation and prosecution. Uh, the legal team can be completely objective and free from the evidential chain. Uh, and the investigation team can focus on the gathering, analyzing and presenting the evidence using trained and experienced criminal investigators. Um, and one key element really and benefit of a private prosecution is to have the investigation team and lawyers working together from the outset, uh, which ensures that the, the process is focused, the legal team can advise on the evidential threshold throughout and also costs are, are kept to a minimum. Um, and Kate and I, as she's mentioned, have worked on many cases together in the past. And I think we can agree that where the investigation team and counsel work closely throughout the case, it ensures that the case is the most evidentially sound and robust, but also it's the most efficient and, and cost effective. Um, so effectively, a private prosecution really is no different from a state run criminal investigation, 
albeit there are inevitable limit limitations on investigation. For example, we have no powers of arrest, search, seizure, and various different access to, to data, but this isn't insurmountable. So in order to ensure an effective, comprehensive and safe investigation and prosecutions conducted, ensuring that the same building blocks required of a criminal investigation are in place and followed correctly, are key to min minimizing the risks and scrutiny associated with a private prosecution. And as I said, these are no different to a state-led investigation, but ensuring the highest standard of specialist police units is adhered to and being overly transparent, fair and cautious uh, will assist the court in ensuring that a private prosecution is being conducted fairly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ensuring that the kind of the ground rules are laid out with the client from the outset are key, and that'll ensure all the relevant material is available uh, to the investigation and legal team, which should ensure that there are no nasty surprises in store for the prosecution when proceedings are commenced, which could potentially jeopardise the case or lead to an abusive process argument. Um, and having a, a solid investigation strategy and case management system in place from the outset will also help with the process which will lay out what the investigation strategy is, outline the lines of inquiry that need to be followed and how the material will be collected and reviewed. Um, evidently, further in lines of inquiry may come to light as the investigation progresses, but having a consideration of it from the outset with a written record of decisions made as the investigation progresses uh, and what decisions and actions are taken will assist in showing the fair and transparent process throughout. Um, witnesses are, are key to any criminal prosecution and a private prosecution is no exception. Uh, they form the backbone of the case, but it's however more likely that they'll be open to more scrutiny than in a state-led prosecution. Um, often the issue of motive, for example, is raised by the defence. So to minimise the, the potential risks with uh, evidence gathering from witnesses, uh, we're overly transparent when taking their evidence. So for example, for key witness accounts, we routinely audio record the witness interviews and any correspondence between us, notes taken, draft statements, emails, et cetera, are all retained as unused material, which ensures the process is totally fair and could be reproduced later if needed uh, and ensures the integrity of their evidence. Um, in terms of exhibits, it, in, terms, in comparison to many state investigations where they're often physical exhibits such as weapons, CCTV, forensic items, and so on, uh, in most private prosecutions, particularly involving fraud, uh, this involves documentary and digital evidence. However, the standards and procedures for exhibit collection, management and review should remain at the highest standard. So ensuring the evidence is captured in the correct way, uh, which shows the provenance, continuity and the integrity of these exhibits is vital, along with ensuring they're exhibited correctly. So having an evidential collection system is key, uh, which should be backed up by a case management system and where needed a digital, a digital forensics and review platform to ensure the forensic data is captured accurately. And that will go a long way to, to proving to the court the integrity of the evidential material. Um, one benefit of a private prosecution is that uh, specialists can be drawn in as, as needed. So for example, forensic accountants, use of e-discovery platforms, expert witnesses, and so on can all be used as required. Um, where unfortunately due to uh, budgetary restraints and resources in state prosecutions, they may not always be brought in an early stage. So having that expert evidence and opinion uh, often ensures the evidence is more robust and having it in early stage can often lead to early guilty pleas and, and quicker judicial, judicial outcome. Um, in comparison to a state-led investigation, obtaining evidence and, and data from third parties can be more problematic, but as I've mentioned before, all reasonable lines of inquiry should be explored. So for example, in a, in a police investigation, evidence can be seized, uh, phone data, financial information can be requested with a relevant authorization. And as I said, police can arrest, search, seize material. Obviously, it's harder to do in a, in a private prosecution, but in many cases, evidence from third parties still needs to be obtained. Um, and it needs to be approached in a proportionate and legal manner, obviously. So, for example, um, it may be that in a case, uh, independent and corroborating witnesses need to be approached and, and their evidence obtained. Uh, and in most cases for doing this, we, we just ask. And uh, in our experience, we find that people are often more responsive to a private company uh, than speaking with the police. I'm not quite sure why that is, but we find that's, that's quite often the case. Um, applications for data can be made to third parties and we'll make written applications using GDPR and DPA exemptions for criminal proceedings. And where required court orders and, and summons um, can be obtained when the matter's in the Crown Court to, accept, to obtain bank statements and other material held 
that would not otherwise be available. So obtaining that evidence um, is obviously needed. Uh, but again, the, the process of that is very open and transparent and everything's in writing, so there's nothing, nothing withheld. Um, but in many cases with the private prosecution, the evidence is already in the, in the possession of the victim, particularly in the case of internal fraud or theft. So the, the material is already there for an initial legal review. Um, which brings me on to disclosure, which is uh, really a key failing in, in, often a key failing in both state and private prosecutions. And I think it's fair to say that private prosecutions are subject to more scrutiny than a state-led prosecution. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that most prosecutions fail due to their disclosure management, which can undermine an entire case if it's done incorrectly, even if the case appears to be evidentially strong, it can, can bring everything down. Um, and we only have to think of the recent cases, for example, Lou Allen, who was uh, accused of um, rape and failures of the, of the state uh, disclosure team to review and disclose digital material meant that he was um, the, the case wasn't reviewed and, and it was ultimately subsequently dropped. So managing the disclosure obligations right from the very first day of the investigation is is crucial to a safe prosecution, and um, and effectively disclosure everything outside of the evidential material in the prosecution case is is our news material. And to all that material, the, the relevance tests applied, which is essentially, is it capable of having an impact on the case? And with uh, the prosecution are duty bound to retain and schedule all that relevant unused material. And to that material, the disclosure test is applied, which ultimately is, does that material assist the defence or undermine the prosecution? And any that does is, is flagged and disclosed to the, to the defence. And ultimately, it comes down to, to fairness of trial. And uh, that's an ongoing process very, from the very first day of the investigation all the way through to, to trial, even during trial. Um, so, so one of the safeguards that um, is very effective in a private prosecution is to have a, a dedicated disclosure officer, which is exactly the same as a, as a police prosecution, who will be responsible for uh, obtaining, collating, scheduling and reviewing that material. Uh, and in most cases, uh, a disclosure management document is produced, which outlines the, the approach to gathering that material, how the material has been gathered and managed and decisions around disclosure. So the whole point is it's an open and transparent process. Uh, it's, it's fair and it leads to ultimately um, assisting the courts that the, the, the prosecution material is reliable and, and leads to safer convictions. So once all the evidential material is gathered, uh, it should be packaged up into an evidential case file, and that's provided to, to the legal team to review. Um, Kate will be able to go into much more detail than I can on this, but effectively the reviewing lawyers will apply or should apply the same test that the Crown Prosecution Service apply, which is a two-stage test, um, whether there's sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction, and if bringing the prosecutions in the public interest. Uh, and if this is satisfied, then a summons is applied for from the magistrate's court, which is then served on the defendant. Um, a key consideration is the fact that these are mainly applied for ex parte. So there's a duty of candour in the prosecution and failure to, to um, adhere to those obligations at this stage can lead to the, the prosecution failing. Um, so in many ways, once the matter's in the Crown Court, that's where the hard work really starts. Um, but in the interest of time, that could probably be a whole other topic. But suffice to say, to get the case to court, uh, during the investigation and, and ensure that the summons and subsequent criminal proceedings are safe, it requires the highest standards of investigation, uh, legal review and counsel. Oh. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, Morris, funding. It's the thing that re people have really tuned in for. <laughs> well, uh, that, uh, the Horizon case, I think, is um, it's a really extreme example of the unfairness that flows from misconceived or badly managed private prosecutions. So we'll see if the Justice Committee recommendations are implemented. Um, Simon's talked about the lessons that can be learned, how you might ensure fairness, um, or indeed, you know, you don't make the mistakes that cause your prosecution to collapse. But before you even get to the point of considering whether or not to mount a private prosecution, of course, the grubby subject of money and funding has to raise its head. Um, and as the Justice Committee recognised, private prosecutions are expensive to bring. So generally it's large organisations or well-resourced individuals who bring them. Um, we are seeing a trend, I think, of law enforcement agencies 
being unwilling or unable to pursue substantial allegations and that might be for reasons of cost or, or other resources. Um, but private prosecutions are an important constitutional right, albeit one which may be expensive to assert. So you know, how do you go about paying for them? Well, clearly um, a private prosecutor can self-fund a case. Um, it's the most common way of doing it. It's what the post office did, um, what the RSPCA does. Um, but the cost involved obviously mean that that's a route that's not open to all. Um, query whether it's right that a private prosecution should only be available to those who can afford it, but um, we'll talk about that another time. Um, another increasingly well-used method to fund litigation generally is crowdfunding. Uh, and that's where a claimant, generally speaking, in a civil case, um, uses an online platform to seek funds from the public, from investors, uh, to cover the costs of legal fees, as well as disbursements such as counsel, the kind of experts that Simon talked about, the um, insurance premiums, which mean you're protected against the defendant's costs if you lose the case. Um, so the claimant may agree to share some of the proceeds of that litigation, some of the damages they receive um, with the investors. Um, and then you also, on, on the crowdfunding theme, you also have platforms like the, the really excellent Crowd Justice, uh, which you might have heard about. Uh, they take donations for costs related to public interest cases generally. But, you know, crowdfunding is, is popular and increasingly popular in litigation. Um, and it is used for private prosecutions. Um, I suspect it's probably not an easy way to raise funds um, to pay for these sorts of cases. The most successful crowdfunding campaigns tend to be linked to causes which capture the public imagination. And I think the best example of that is probably um, the private prosecution that Marcus Ball mounted against Boris Johnson. Um, for misconduct in a public office. That was the one about lying on the side of the bus um, saying there was going to be 350 million pounds a week for the NHS. And whatever the merits of that case, it was a successful fundraising campaign. He, um, he managed to raise about half a million pounds, I think. So there are other older examples. It's not a very new thing. Um, in 2014, I think it was probably the first crowdfunded private prosecution, um, which was brought for um, a, a case relating to the death uh, of a cyclist by careless driving. Um, and I know there was another one in 2017, which was uh, a crowdfunded private prosecution uh, for rape. And neither of those cases was successful. So having funding doesn't necessarily mean you improve the prospects of a prosecution, but it can mean, as Simon talked about, you do have extra resource to get good early um, expert opinion. We will know, won't we, from practice that um, that you know well resources, well resourced defence uh, uh, teams can often um, do very well indeed. Um, but the point about crowdfunding, I think, is that it does enable people to bring cases which otherwise couldn't be brought, um, and it's important to hold people to account. Um, I think there's a separate point just in passing about, um, you know, seeking funds from members of the public. I'm not, my own view is I don't think you should be able to do that without, um, you know, the case having an advice that it's got arguable merits. I think you need a proper case. It should be a meritorious case that's being brought if you're going to ask people to fund your case. Um, so, you know, crowdfunding ensures you've got a fighting fund. Solicitors can be satisfied that there are funds available to pay their fees. Um, generally speaking, I think those fund, uh, those firms that offer, uh, um, that take on crowdfunded work, offer generous discounts or some kind of conditional fee arrangement. Um, and so litigation funders, uh, you know, what about them and private prosecutions? Well, there's no great mystery to litigation funding. It's like a form of crowdfunding, but on a commercial scale. Uh, so at Harbour, we've got just over $1 billion under management, uh, and that's money we've raised from professional investors. So pension funds, endowment funds, and that kind of thing. Um, and actually litigation funding works quite simply. Um, we pay all the legal fees and the disbursements over the lifetime of a case. And in exchange, when the case wins, 
um, despite all of our best efforts and experience, not all of them do win. Uh, but when a case wins, as we hope most of them will, um, then money's recovered from the other side, from the losing party. And then we agree, we receive a pre-agreed share of, um, of whatever is recovered. If the case loses, then our funding, our investment gets written off completely and we lose that. Um, and importantly, the person who's bringing the case um, owes us nothing. So we all know litigation is uncertain, um, and that means the risk to our funds is quite high. Um, so as a result, it's not an inexpensive solution. Um, to give you an illustration of uh, how it works, the Horizon case is actually a really good example. Um, and you have a series there of self-funded um, private prosecutions. Uh, those prosecutions resulted uh, in a number of convictions. Uh, Kate talked about it. Um, a number of them have successfully overturned their convictions on the CACRC's referral. I'm sure there may be more appeals as a result. Um, and you heard about the civil claim for damages. So that was about 500 of those sub postmasters and postmistresses. And if each of those um, claimants had brought a case individually, it would have cost more than the amount that they were claiming. Um, it wouldn't have been economic to bring that litigation. So without the litigation funder who supported the case, the claimants couldn't have paid the huge upfront costs themselves, and that case would probably never have got off the ground. So they grouped together, there were economies of scale in grouping together, but it meant the big costs like uh, lawyers fees, um, the costs of insurance, the costs of experts, all of that had to be paid up front, and the funder paid that rather than the claimants themselves. Um, so that's how it works. Thinking about it in the context of private prosecutions, um, as opposed to any subsequent civil litigation, which was how the funder got involved in the Horizon case. Um, I don't know of many uh, funders, if any, that have supported a private prosecution. That includes Harbour, um, and for reasons I'll explain. When, when a litigation funder looks at a case, when we consider cases for funding, there's generally four things that will look at. So the first and the most important for us is recoverability. For us, it's an investment. Um, so we want to know that we'll get our money back plus, ideally, a return on that. Uh, I've touched upon it, but the second thing is economic. So we want to make sure that the costs of running the case don't outweigh any recoveries that might be made. You know, there's no, there's no point in paying three million pounds in fees if the case is a dispute about one million pounds and that's the maximum you're ever going to get back. Um, third thing is the team. We want to make sure there's a really experienced team running the case who have a good track record in successfully concluding similar cases. And for the reasons that Simon outlined, there are so many pitfalls when it comes to private prosecutions. We would always want a really um, experienced legal team to be running it to make sure that those traps aren't fallen into. Um, and lastly, from our perspective, for you as lawyers, it's probably the first thing you'll consider. Um, uh, but the you know, merits, um, are, they're obviously important, but it's probably last on our list. Um, for us, protecting our investors' money is uh, slightly more important than making sure the case has good merits. Of course, the case has to have good merits for us to fund it, but um, you know, that's the last of those four things that we would, that we would look at. And if you're applying that in the context of, of private prosecution, I think the reason why funders haven't historically got very involved in private prosecutions is this point about recoverability. So um, most money um, that flows from a defendant, if any, um, post-conviction is, is generally going to be coming under a confiscation order. So the, the case is generally, for a funder, the case is generally going to have, uh, need to have some other pot which might generate a, a return. So compensation orders are probably the most obvious um, thing. Um, and generally speaking, it's most likely that that kind of return of funds is going to come in the context of a financial crime prosecution. I guess not exclusively, but um, I would have thought in most cases, it, it, it's unlikely a funder would fund a general crime private prosecution. Um, it may be that mounting a private prosecution is part of a wider litigation strategy. So there may be civil litigation ongoing. Um, the litigation funder may fund a private prosecution um, as part of a portfolio or a group of cases. Um, clearly, I think in that context, if that's the case, 
we are going to look very closely at um, the prosecutor's motivation. It can't be tainted by an oblique motive, um, as the case has it. You can't use you can't use the private prosecution as a strategy to make your defendant settle a civil case. So we will look closely at that. Um, from a funder's perspective, uh, there are attractive features about well-run private prosecutions. And I think the biggest one is um, costs. In contrast to most of the cases we fund, um, generally you won't suffer from an adverse cost risk. Um, clearly, that's not 100% of the time, unless there's misconduct by the prosecutor or omissions or improper acts. Um, but, you know, the fact that you can recover your prosecution costs and therefore at least a proportion of our investment, um, the fact that you can recover that from central funds is attractive to, um, to a funder because that's not always the case um, when we look at civil matters that we fund. Um, we don't assume, of course, that recovery of costs is a given. We know that that's at the discretion of the judge. Um, but when we're considering cases, it is comforting for us to know that this has been given some thought. And that goes back to the point about uh, needing an experienced legal team running the case. Um, other things we want to see, obviously, it needs to relate to an, an, an indictable offence. You know, we want to make sure that prosecution costs are actually recoverable. Um, we'll want a sense of the scale of the economic crime alleged, um, how much might reasonably um, expect, uh, how much we can expect to be recovered via a compensation order, if any. Um, we'll want to see a proper budget from you, not just for trial, but for pre-charge investigation costs. Uh, we'll pay those, we can pay those. Um, we know that they're generally unrecoverable, although I think that's under appeal. Um, there might be a case on that in the early part of next year. Um, the courts are slow at the moment, but the other thing a funder will want to know is how long it might be until the trial. And unlike civil cases where there's often a risk of um, a chance of settlement at an earlier stage, for a private prosecution, clearly you're going to trial. So we need a sense of how long that might take, because that gives us a sense of how long our capital is going to be tied up. Um, what are, we'd want to see that the fusion points um, are covered. So um, Simon's already mentioned it, but I think you know we'll want to know that you've contacted the police or whatever relevant body it is, and they've declined to take it on. We want to make sure that your recovery uh, isn't capped to CPS rates, um, and you know you'll need to show that it's reasonable for you to be instructed as opposed to you know some local solicitor that doesn't necessarily have the same experience that you do. Um, thinking about enforcement, that's obviously an important uh, issue for a funder, you know, when you're talking about money coming back in, we've seen a lot of money going out, it's nice to know when money starts coming back in. So um, it's good for us to get, get a sense from you about uh, what might be required to appoint a receiver and recover assets from the convicted defendant. Um, I think Samaya said those costs aren't recoverable, you might have seen uh, a case last month of Merchant Dani, um, which is interesting for us. Um, it suggests the costs of enforcement can be recovered. Um, we'll see if that stands up, but certainly for recovery of costs, uh, that's good news. So, uh, you know, the general kind of um, thoughts of funders about prosecution, private prosecutions, I think we're going to see, wait and see if the government acts on the Justice Committee's recommendations. Uh, that might lead to a restriction in the ability of a private prosecutor to recover costs. Um, it may not have so much of an impact on you know, compensation orders, but you need to add compensation orders to the fact that you may be able to recover costs, I think, for it to be most attractive to a funder. Um, so for the moment, I think it, it remains a really interesting area for litigation funders. Um, Bug Harbour, you know, we'd be happy to explore cases with you. And, you know, if you do want to talk about it, then we're obviously really happy to do that. You'll have the contact details. Just, just let us know. Just get in touch. Great, Morris. Thank you very much. We've got, we're not, we're not, uh, we, we weren't going to take questions, but actually a couple came in by email in advance and we've just about got time to squeeze two in. So um, while you're there, um, do you think the rise in private prosecutions means that there is growth for greater involvement of litigation funders? Do you think that's inevitable? Yeah, I, I think, well, it's an interesting trend. Um, there were some statistics in the Justice Committee report um, 
I think two private prosecutions in 2014 and something like 57 or 60 um, last year. So, um, you know, I think it's obviously an increasing trend. I think litigation funding is difficult to make work for private prosecutions for the reasons I've talked about. But I think we will see more involvement of funders in the economic crime space. You know, the difficulties at the SFO are well known. Um, practitioners will know how slowly fraud cases can move. And there are really big fraud cases that aren't being prosecuted. And I'm sure that trend is going to continue. So I think, you know, practitioners will be doing more private prosecutions. Um, there's no money in the magic government money tree for the Ministry of Justice budget. So if the state's not going to intervene, then it, I think it's inevitable that well-resourced um, victims of financial crime will do more prosecutions. And I think the more economic crime cases you have, the larger in scale they are, I think you're definitely going to see more involvement from, um, from funders. Certainly sounds logical, doesn't it? Mm. And uh, one for you, Simon. Um, if there is a rise in private prosecutions, there are going to be more of them. What are the key considerations for someone thinking of bringing a private prosecution? Maybe just half a dozen bullet points of key considerations for someone in the, in the couple of minutes we've got. Yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the main thing is that they're, they're not to be undertaken lightly. Um, you know, there's a very high burden of proof. Um, and ultimately, you know, someone could potentially lose their liberty, go to prison. Um, so, as I said, they're not, not to be taken lightly. And, and motive, uh, Morris has touched on it as before, but motive is obviously a key consideration. So using a private prosecution as leverage in a civil claim uh, is open to abusive process arguments. And, and ultimately, the motive should be bringing a private prosecution in the interests of justice. Um, obviously, gathering evidence is, is arguably more difficult than in a state-run investigation, but it can be, it can be done. Uh, and ultimately, there are challenges to the procedures and hurdles to, to overcome. Um, that said, obviously, in the, the current climate, uh, with budgetary restraints and understandable changing priorities for, for the police and other state prosecuting bodies, uh, fraud and certainly sort of corporate fraud and other similar offences just unfortunately aren't investigated and prosecuted by the state. And um, so private prosecution offers an opportunity for, for justice when it might not otherwise be possible. And and it's already been touched on, but a, a well-funded and resourced prosecution, provided it's brought correctly, uh, can bring cases before the criminal courts comparatively quickly. Uh, and depending on the crime, there are arguably more resources than the state may have. Uh, so a wider, more thorough investigation can lead to early guilty pleas, uh, which obviously reduces costs and, and provides quicker access to justice. And as I've mentioned, you know, all the sentencing options are open to the court, including prison compensation, cost recovery, and so on, which I won't go over again. But um, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, it's, it, as I said, it's not something to be taken lightly, but as a recourse to justice for a victim of crime it, in times of austerity, austerity, it's a fantastic tool when this may not otherwise be possible. Great. Well, thank you both very much for your time. To everybody who's listening, thank you for your time as well, and thank you for attending. If you have any questions, there'll be a follow-up email. You'll have um, everyone's contact details in any event. But do drop either uh, us a line in Chambers or Simon or Morris directly. They're both very contactable and will be delighted to answer questions that you have. I hope it's been useful. and We're bang on time. So enjoy your Thursday evening all. Thank you, Kate.